is Love Your Work. On this show, we help you make it as a creative. I'm David Cadavy. If you want to join us here on Love Your Work every Thursday, please hit subscribe on your podcast app and sign up for the Love Mondays newsletter. I've studied history's greatest creatives, and each Monday I share with you the very best lessons I have learned. It is a two-minute-a-week commitment. It is free. Sign up at cadavy.net slash Mondays. Donald M. Ratner is an architect and author of My Creative Space, How to Design Your Home to Stimulate Ideas and Spark Innovation. I've talked a lot on this podcast about matching your work to your mental state. If you're in the mood to do the work that you're doing, everything is going to be easier. But you can also match your mental state to the work. You can change your mental state so the work you need to be doing gets done. And one powerful way to change your mental state is to change your surroundings. If you design your space to think more creatively, that is to encourage more creative thinking, for example, you are going to do better creative work. In my creative space, Donald draws upon mountains of research from the field of environmental psychology to show you how to change your space to change your creativity. In this conversation, you'll learn How has the field of environmental psychology shown how the spaces where you work can change everything from your thinking to your physiology? And research shows that the optimal light level for creativity is 150 lux, and the optimal noise level for creativity is 70 decibels. Now, just how bright and how loud is that, and why does it work? And travel posters, especially vintage travel posters, may help you think more creatively. Donald explains why, when it comes to creativity, construal level theory, something you might remember from my conversation with David Rock, favors things far away in distance and time. This conversation is packed with knowledge, and so is Donald's book. Don't forget, I'm having a webinar very soon. It is this weekend, in fact. It's this Sunday, so maybe you're late in listening to this episode and you missed it. If not, if you're one of the lucky ones, let me tell you about this webinar. If you work for yourself or if you aspire to work for yourself, if you are or want to be a solopreneur, do not miss this webinar. The big challenge in working for yourself is getting yourself to do the work and getting yourself to do the right work. That's tough, especially if you're somebody like me. If you're a curious person who has a lot of interests and you have hair trigger motivation, it can be very difficult to get yourself to do the right work. And if you ever wonder how it is that I manage to consistently crank out quality podcast episodes, blog posts, books, no matter what it is that comes my way, I'm going to teach you. I'm sharing my best self-motivation tips from over a decade as a solopreneur. It's in my upcoming webinar. It's this Sunday. It's called Self-Motivation for Solopreneurs. It is absolutely free. And if you don't always get done as a solopreneur, everything you want to get done as a solopreneur, you do not want to miss this free webinar. Learn more and sign up at cadavy.net slash motivation. That is cadavy.net slash motivation. I cannot wait to see you there. Thank you so much to our Patreon supporters. You all make the show possible. I really appreciate it. I know that thousands of other listeners appreciate it too. Now, why should you support on Patreon? I asked Alice why she supported and she said, I have been listening to your podcast and following your journey for about two years. I find your curiosity and honesty refreshing, real, and encouraging. Your ever-thoughtful approach to sharing your growth, questioning the status quo whilst contributing to others makes your podcast thought-provoking, stimulating, and educational. I have learned a lot and found myself interested in topics I would have never considered. I have also enjoyed the Love Mondays newsletter you have been producing. Incredibly grateful for your work and the difference it has made to my life, and I assume will continue to do And this is the reason I am now supporting you financially. Thank you so much for that, Alice. I love to get these heartfelt messages. I love to know that this work is resonating with people. And especially when you support the show on Patreon, I really get that message. So thank you so much. We don't have a ton of supporters contributing financially, but they all do help. And I'm also glad to hear that Alice is enjoying the Love Mondays newsletters. Those are free. Sign up for those at academy.net slash Mondays. I really like writing them each week. Okay, here is Donald M. Ratner. I'm 
I'm here with Donald M. Ratner, who is author of My Creative Space, How to Design Your Home to Stimulate Ideas and Spark Innovation. And I guess first there's this idea that our spaces can influence our mental state and then can in turn influence our behavior. So I think a lot of us don't even think about this. So do we know a lot about this? Is this a field of study? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that as a scientific discipline uh, in its own right, it first really emerges in the late 1960s, call it 1970, and it takes the form of something called environmental psychology, which is just what it sounds like. It's the study of how the environment, whether built or natural, influences how we think, feel, and act. And uh, for the last, what now, 40 years or so, almost 50, um, scientists have been researching very closely how various stimuli coming to us from the outside world uh, do just that, uh, change the way we behave, change the way we think, change the way we act. So there's quite a bit of information out there that we can draw from. Mm -hmm. And you're coming at this as an architect. Uh, So have, have you been integrating this knowledge into your practice? As much as I possibly can, absolutely. Um, there is something I think uh, some of your readers may know called evidence-based uh, design. So evidence-based design is, again, sort of what it sounds like. It's that we want to take the evidence that science gives us and apply it to our architectural work or our landscape work. And people have been doing this for quite a few years, most particularly in the healthcare center uh, sector, mm-hmm. uh, but also now as we're seeing in the area of creative space, because we've begun to find very definite links between shape or the appearance or the sound or the smell of our space and how well we think creatively. Well, just to touch on that field a bit, what are some things we've seen like in the healthcare space, uh, connections between architecture and, and healthcare outcomes? Oh, quite a bit of things. Uh, for one, um, the relationship of the interior to the exterior. So there was a very famous uh, study done in 1984 uh, in a hospital, uh, actually west of Philadelphia, where the researcher took a bunch of patients who were all in the hospital roughly at the same time, roughly for the, uh, for the same surgical procedure, roughly the same age group, staying in almost identical rooms in one particular wing of the hospital on the second and third floors. They were all facing in the same direction. The only thing that was different about their environment and their condition was what they saw through the window. So roughly half the patients, just because of where they were along the corridor, when they looked out their windows, they would see the leaves of trees, greenery, foliage, because at some point somebody had planted some trees down at one end of the courtyard that they overlooked. The other half of the patients, when they looked from their beds across this courtyard, what they saw was a blank brick wall of another wing of the hospital. So you have almost exact same conditions for everybody except what they saw through the window from their bed. So this researcher pulls these records and lo and behold, he found there's quite a few differences between the patient outcomes and their environment. Those who saw the foliage had shorter hospital stays, required less medication, had fewer complications than those who saw the brick wall. So, you know, think about that for a moment. Something outside the human body is influencing Hmm. nothing less than human physiology itself. So there's a clear example about how the outside environment can influence our basic human condition. Wow, that's a powerful example in a matter really of life and death. Um, Exactly. And so we can take you know, other things from that field uh, in matters that are less serious than life and death, matters of enhancing our creativity, being more creative. So if we are trying to optimize our space for creativity, you know, what are, what are we going for? What are like the, the, the basic things that we're going for that will result in more creative thinking just from a psychological standpoint? Sure. So, um, you know, in this book, I've covered a total of 48 different what I call tactics, techniques, means of boosting creativity by manipulating physical space or also how we use it. And there's one particular group that I, that more or less starts off the book. And these are a set of tactics that have to do with our sense of space uh, call it the expansiveness of space. That is the feeling like the space around us is ample and maybe even expanding. So there are various things you can do with a given space to make it feel even larger than it actually is, or in your mind, feel like it's open and almost continuous with the outside. One of the obvious things is you can 
have a window view and take uh, partake of that view so they have a sense that you're not purely enclosed in a you know internal space but that there's an outside world you can do things like even paint your walls uh, say the color blue or green both of which are cool colors and optically appear to recede from the viewer that is they appear to move away from the viewer as opposed to say warm colors like a red if you painted the same space in a red color those walls would feel like they were converging towards you Mm -hmm. Uh, ceiling height is another uh, uh, correlation that they have found between space and mental um, uh, genera- idea generation. So generally the threshold for a good um, space for generating ideas would be 10 feet or higher, whereas eight feet and lower, you start to uh, become more focused in your thinking, more analytic, more um, calculating in a way, which is kind of the mirror, of course, of creative thinking. So there's a whole bunch of techniques that have to do with your sense of the surrounding space that really can pump up creative thinking. So it sounds like at a base level, openness or large spaces are an important factor to to optimize for. Why is that? Well, I would say, first of all, I I don't know that space necessarily has to be large. I would say it has to be, uh, first of all, it has to be ample to meet your needs. Whatever kind of creative work you're doing, you shouldn't feel like you're necessarily cramped uh, in some kind of tight space. So as long as it's ample, but the feeling that it is not so much bounded as it is expansive. Um, But think of the the way we use the word openness when talking about creative performance. We talk about open-mindedness, open to experience, open to new ideas is people who are creative are all of those things. So the sense of openness is important for your kind of psyche to sense that I'm not constrained by what is, I can explore what could be uh, just as much. Hmm. Okay. And so is there a certain type of thinking that that is optimizing for or that that's uh, I- encouraging? I mean, is it just as simple as oh, it's creative thinking or is there some base level type of thinking, category of thinking underneath that? Yeah, maybe the best way to kind of explain all this is to talk about uh, divergent and convergent thinking. Um, so divergent and convergent thinking is a concept that was really first developed by a psychologist named J.P. Guilford uh, in a book he wrote in 1967. So let me uh, maybe best to describe this by um, kind of painting a picture of a diagram uh, for your listeners to consider. So uh, the way we can in- model this this form of of thinking is to start with a diamond, take a diamond shape, turn it on its side. So the long axis is running kind of left, right. All right. Then in your mind's eye, or if you want to doodle along with this, take that diamond and kind of cut it in half just in the middle and just separate those two triangles just slightly. Okay. So you basically have two triangles facing each other contiguous along one side in the middle. Okay. Then let's put a question mark all the way on the far left. And let's put a exclamation point all the way on the far right. So this is our model of creative thinking. According to J.P. Guilford, I want you to take the left triangle and label it, label it below divergent and take the right triangle and label it below convergent. Okay, so here we've got these two, what they call cognitive styles, forms of mental processing. Now let's mm-hmm. work through the creative process. Start on the left. We have a question mark, right? So what is that? That is our problem to be solved. What are you looking at? You're basically looking at a blank canvas, a blank piece of paper, a blank computer screen, a blank tablet, a blank sheet of paper on which you will draw. And you start literally opening up your mind to ideas, right? You start with nothing, but then you start scribbling or doodling or whatever it is that you do to get the process going. And more and more, you're cranking out ideas as a kind of embryonic beginning to solving this problem. What you've done, of course, is to create choices. Mm -hmm. And that is what divergent uh, thinking is all about. So if you can picture moving from left to right, from the corner of the triangle on the far left, the vertices, you're broadening your mind, right? Look at the way the space is expanding. So my kind of thesis is that our mental space expands and contracts in direct relationship to our perception of physical space. That's why these ideas of broadening your space will broaden your mind and create the a greater sense of possibility. Okay, but you get to that middle of that diamond where the triangles have broken apart and you go, holy moly, I've got you know, a client meeting in a week or whatever it is. I can't just keep doing this forever. You've got to start narrowing down. You've got to start winnowing. You've got to start 
making choices rather than just creating more of them. So you start entering what's called the convergent phase of the creative process where you're, you know, trying to verify, is this idea really going to work? And on and on you go converging, narrowing your mental space, focusing on what you hoped will be the aha moment, that exclamation point at the end where you go, this works, I'm going to take this one to the client. But that is the idea of expansive space and narrowing space, mimicking in physical space. Mm -hmm. And so what we are optimizing then for is, is this divergent thinking that you're talking about? That's correct. And that's what I really focus on the book, because look, we're pretty good at convergent thinking as it is. Why? Well, first of all, because that's what we're taught in school, right? We're taught to get that one right answer on the tests so we can get a, you know, our degree and go to a good college and then get a good job. And then once we're in you got a good job and we're living kind of adult life, our creativity tends to be suppressed to some degree because, you know, to be creative means to take risks, to go out on a limb, to do things that are not conventional. And maybe we're, well, maybe we're afraid of going to our employer and saying, you know, why don't we try this idea instead of what we've been doing? Because if you get shot down, maybe you won't get that promotion or advancement or you'll be ridiculed. So there's a lot of social pressure on us as adults and um, a lot of pressure on us even as children in the educational process, all of which makes us very good convergent thinkers. But where we really need help these days is in that kind of divergent phase. And that's what I focus on in the book. Right. And so we've already touched a little bit on the idea of space or openness of space. And you were saying that the space itself doesn't necessarily have to be uh, large, which is good news for me because I seem to always live in like a 400, 500 mm -hmm. square foot apartment. Uh, so what are some things you can do if you, you can't just go uh, knock down your neighbor's wall and, and uh, double the size of your apartment? Well, you know, there's quite a quite a few tactics that have to do with other aspects of creativity. Um, some of them are very practical minded. Some of them are rooted in kind of our psychological processes. So, for example, uh, you know, simple things like put your walls to work is one of the tactics that I uh, talk about. And in in that regard, I'm talking about, say, taking one wall and putting whiteboard paint on it and using that for markups and idea generation. Mm. You know, it's a very practical idea, but there's a lot of uh, research underneath as to why this really helps our creative thinking. For example, first of all, there's the idea of idea capture, um, which is to say, look, we're, we're going to forget most ideas within 10 to 15 seconds of having them. And as soon as you externalize them, whether it's on a whiteboard wall or in a journal, you've literally captured that idea. Not only that you freed up some mental bandwidth because you know what our brains are not infinite they can't remember all that stuff and as soon as you can offload that idea you're making room for new ones and you can also start developing that idea on the whiteboard wall or chalkboard wall or whatever it is because again the brain can only think so much internally it needs to kind of interact with an idea that's been concretized outside the self and if you have any doubts on how important that is, I mean, just look at people like Einstein and Leonardo, who, when they died, left tens of thousands of pages of notes. So these are some of the smartest people in history. If they needed to externalize ideas, we sure as heck do yeah. as well. And there's even other benefits. So let's say somebody comes over to your home and sees your scribbling on the wall and they say, you know, that's interesting. I've been thinking about the same thing. You can start to get kind of collisions of ideas by publicizing it, by putting it out there, even in a kind of modest way at home. So there's lots of benefits to things like that. Um, even the shape of your furniture can can influence how you're thinking. There's been a study where uh, researchers compared furniture, which is generally, let's say, rounded in kind of profile, curvilinear, sort of soft shapes overall versus furniture that's much more crisp, much more rectilinear, formed of mostly straight lines. And it turns out we have kind of an innate affinity for the curved elements uh, amongst furniture than we do the rectilinear ones. And this gets down into something called evolutionary psychology, which is kind of a sub-discipline of, of environmental psychology. So evolutionary psychology basically says, you know, we are who we have always been in the sense that we are genetically coded in ways that go back to the very first homo sapiens. So what's up with the curve versus straight thing? Well, when you think about it, things that are curved generally are, uh, they're not harmful. They don't represent potential harm to oneself. Whereas things with very straight edges like animal teeth or jagged rock outlines, they cause harm or at least they pose the threat of harm. And we are wired, of course, and they to enable us to survive and thrive, to kind of back away from 
things that potentially could cause us harm, whereas we will approach or we will be more welcoming to things which are rounded and unthreatening. That's called approach avoidance motivation, and it plays a lot into our kind of creative uh, model of creative thinking that we just talked about, divergent convergence. So when we're confronted with potential danger, we tend to go into a convergent uh, cognitive style. Why? Because we need to find a one right solution to our problem to get us out of our predicament. We want to be analytical, very logical. We want facts. We want information. We don't want to kind of wander around uh, thinking about what might be while we're being, you know, pummeled by uh, a rock or a, an animal that's coming up to harm us. So they, you know, so a lot of these tactics, they just have very um, long seated foundations in our psyche. And they're often mm-hmm. operating in ways that we're not even aware of. Uh, they're often operating subliminally, affecting us. But once you kind of start seeing them on the page and start understanding them, you can apply them to your own environment. Mm-hmm. So in, say, turning a, an entire wall into something that we can write on, uh, that's kind of a way of making the space feel more open to us? Is, is there any connection there between the idea that, you know, if I'm writing in a tiny little notebook, is that going to affect my thinking differently from if I've got my arms up and I'm moving my arms in uh, wide circles or uh, large movements as I am writing on uh, on a wall, if I have an entire wall open to me to write on? Yes, exactly. I th- my little phrase is, if you want to think big, draw big. So a journal is great. It's portable. We take it with us. It's absolutely critical to the creative process. But as you say, once you can enlarge that drawing space to the scale, to an architectural scale of a wall, then you're going to start having bigger ideas. Um, you also mentioned kind of the motion of the hand of physical locomotion. That plays a big part into generating ideas as well. A lot of the tactics um, are connected to the the fact that creativity and locomotion seem to go in hand in hand. So I'm sure many of your listeners have heard taking walks, uh, exercising, all of these things that get the blood flowing, that get the body flowing are almost always positive in terms of creative output. And that, again, may be traced back to our kind of, you know, historical selves, our evolutionary selves. It's been predicted or uh, postulated that early humans walked up to 15 miles a day. So somehow creating the number one problem or addressing the number one creative problem, which is how do I survive and locomotion and physicality all go hand in hand. And speaking of the hand, (laughs) the last thing I would say about the working wall and the whiteboard wall is that we tend to think of creativity as something that originates in the brain and kind of gets channeled to our hand or whatever uh, uh, part of the body we need to kind of concretize it well. As it turns out, the research is showing that ideas flow both directions, that the hand can generate just as many ideas and send them into the brain as vice versa. So just the act of drawing, whether it is in a notebook or on a whiteboard wall, is, is enormously helpful in generating ideas. Well, how do they observe that? Well, there's there's lots of studies where you might have someone, uh, one test group, trying to solve a creative problem by hand and another, say, just speaking it, uh, talking the solution. So you can measure where the hand is involved and where a kind of non-manual uh, solution is generated and compare the two. And there, you know, there's a very strong... Uh, Uh, industry, I guess you could call it, in the creativity metrics. So a lot of this research is about measuring creative output in very, um, you know, objective ways. There's a whole set of criteria that have been developed. Some of uh, your listeners may know the Torrance test for creative thinking and other metrics. So this stuff isn't just kind of, well, looks like this is better for creativity. No, there's a lot of measurable uh, output that scientists and researchers can point to, um, to to advance the ideas. Now, uh, other ways that we can create uh, a more of a sense of space, you've mentioned turning a wall into a chalkboard or, or a whiteboard. Uh, you, you've mentioned color, like painting it blue. Are, are there any other things that we can do if we don't really have the luxury of having a big space to uh, make our space feel more open and to get those creative ideas flowing? Well, simple things like um, orienting your furniture relative to the space. So, you know, I think it's, not uncommon among folks to take their, let's say, desk or work table and butt it against a wall because they kind of work together as two straight planes coming into contact. And um, as a result of that, I think a couple of maybe negative conditions arise for in terms of, you know, creativity boosting. One is that your 
sense of space is compressed, right? Because you're literally 20 inches, 24 inches away from that wall that you are now facing when you're seated or standing at your desk. So your perception of space has gone into more of a convergent mode, which isn't necessarily healthy with the idea generation. Um, the other problem is that your back is literally facing into the space, right? If you're necessarily facing a wall, then behind you is the space itself. So there's something called prospect refuge theory, another kind of evolutionary-based um, theory, which says that, look, early humankind was programmed to seek out habitats that afforded maximum prospect, meaning view or you know, surveillance that they could see, let's say, 180 degrees in front of them, but at the same time, creating a sense of safety in both fact and sense. So your sides and back would be protected, whereas in front of you was this open view. So ideally, your vantage point would be up on a hill, let's say, or mountainside, and you would be looking down over the valley, but your surroundings were either rocky or, or forested, so you wouldn't be liable to attack from behind or above, but you could see everything in front of you. So when we are sitting with our face to a wall, and a space behind us, we're kind of violating our, you know, genetic inheritance, our DNA, by exposing our back. Now, this is very subtle stuff because, of course, now we're not expecting to be attacked in our own homes from behind by a wild animal. And yet our brains, because evolution moves so slowly, haven't caught up to the fact that we're now living in a modern built environment. Uh, you know, we spent several hundred thousands of years, millions, if you want to go back to the earliest hominids, in a natural environment. It's only in the last 0.001% of time that we find that we're now spending 90% of our waking hours or all our hours indoors. So the brain hasn't caught up to that fact yet. So think about turning around that desk in some way or maybe perpendicular to the wall, face into the space. If you have a window, uh, either be opposite or even better as a slightly oblique view. So it's kind of on your, your right or your left side. That immediately will uh, expand the sense of space. Wait, so this is why when I go to a restaurant, I hate having my back towards the space because I'm, I'm worried somebody is going to come and knock me over the head and take my food from me. Is that <laughs> That's exactly right. Now, if you were a gangster, you'd really hate to sit with your back to the door because you'd be afraid that one of your rival gangsters would be bursting in uh, any minute yeah. and riddling you with bullets. Uh, but seriously, folks, that's a, it's, a, it's even been studied that people innately will choose seats that have the more, better vantage point than those that face the door from their backs. Now, there's one thing that, I experience that is a little bit contradictory to this. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about it. It's that I like to have my desk in like a little cove where I face a blank wall. And just for the first couple hours in the morning when I'm uh, doing like a creative writing session or something like that, not all day, but just for a couple of hours, I really like to be able to face that blank wall. I find I'm really able to stay on task. And as a result, I'm able to uh, write a little bit more. Do you have any thoughts about why that is? Well, here's the thing about all of these studies, all of the scientific research. What they're generally measuring is, call it the general population, the average person, this sort of abstraction, right? When it gets down to the individual, it is absolutely about what works for you. And if that works for you, you know, that's all you need to know. You don't have to worry about this research. It's not like you're doing something wrong. Of course, you could try other approaches uh, by applying some of these tactics and say, hmm, this is even better. But but if it's working for you, absolutely. So there's a lot of um, you know personalization that needs to happen. Color is a very good example when you're considering these tactics. Color is a very good example of that. So color operates on multiple levels. There is the sort of universal level, which are things like blue color is almost everybody likes. It evokes a positive emotion. Same with green. I think that's pretty obvious why green, of course, is nature. And we all respond positively. That crosses cultural boundaries. Then you get things which are culturally kind of rooted. So interestingly, uh, in China, black is a good luck color, whereas in Western countries, in the U.S., we generally consider it a kind of a downer, has more funereal associations. And then there's sort of the personal level, which is, you know, if you grew up in a, a green or let's say purple bedroom and you had a really happy childhood, Purple is going to have a positive association for you regardless of mm. what the research says. So these things often have to be tempered by the individual, but this is a good place to start. Well, how about this theory? Maybe maybe this makes some sense is that in the morning, I like to say that, oh, I'm more, I'm more groggy. I'm a little bit more creative that way. And so it's almost like my mind is so open 
that if I were to face my desk out the window, it would like be too much. It would be too much divergent thinking for me. I wouldn't actually be able to uh, complete uh, my task. Would there be any validity to that? Is there an interaction between your mental state at that moment uh, and what space you choose to put yourself in in that moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think you touched on something, you know, absolutely valid there, which is if you start looking out the window, you know, your eyes going to get drawn to different things. You may go off in ways you hadn't expected. Sounds to me like when you get up and you start kind of doing some of the things, you have a little bit of an idea of what you want to start writing about. Mm. You know, it's somewhat spontaneous, but it's probably been nesting in there during sleep and so forth and in the first waking hours. So you want to get right, uh, right to it. You want to have a direct connection with your notebook. That absolutely makes sense um, for you. So in that case, it's not about, you know, seeking that broader sense of openness and space. It's about, let me communicate my thoughts to the page. So that's absolutely valid. Yeah. So I can see how maybe it's like, um, there's different types of creativity. There's like the creativity where, yeah, it's creative, I'm writing, but I'm also, I'm trying to produce something. So if I'm, if I'm really stuck on a problem, or I'm really trying to think through my business, actually, this is, this is a thing that I used to do, was when I was trying to come up with a really big idea, you know, like I'm really stuck on something. I really want to get a 30,000 foot foot view of everything that's going on in my business or a project. I actually would go to a cafe on the 95th floor of the John Hancock Tower in Chicago. And at the time, you could just get a table right next to uh, the window and just look out over all of Chicago, all of Lake Michigan, etc., And I found that wasn't necessarily, you know, let's get things done type of place for me to go. But it was something that gave me bigger, higher level ideas that sort of scrambled up uh, maybe whatever it was I was working on at the time. Does that make any sense? Uh, makes total sense. It's very interesting there. So you mentioned going up at the top of a tower. Um, just recently, there was a study done of stock traders uh, who are all working in a high-rise tower. And what they found is that the stock traders in the upper floors tended to take more risks, oh, wow. which usually gets you more money if you take the right risks than the guys, gals at the lower floors. So here you have a perfect example of how the perception of space influences your mental processing, because again, taking risks is part of creative test performance. Um, so a couple of things here. One of all, first of all, there is something called construal level theory, which plays right into that. So construal level theory says, look, the farther away you perceive an object or an incident or event, the more abstract, broad-minded, big picture, broad brush thinking mindset you get into. And conversely, the closer, the more narrow and focused and detailed you get. Um, so your <laughs> description of that you know, work habit um, plays exactly into that. Um, Mm. The other thing is that, yes, look, creativity is not a, you know, it's not even really a two-phase process. There are early, early stage, there's mid-early stage, there's late divergent thinking, I think, you know, as you kind of go through that process, yes, things can start veering in one direction or the other or become more focused or less focused. So, The idea of having an impasse is also a particular kind of stage or part of creativity. So what they found is when you have impasses, the best thing to do is do exactly what you did, which is take a break. You got to let your brain incubate the information that's already swirling around. It needs time to kind of process, cogitate, consolidate, possibly find links among ideas that are floating around. And to do that, the best thing to do is to stop working on the problem altogether. Mm -hmm. Your mind is working very hard in the kind of back of your head. And by taking that break, by letting it incubate, by stepping away from it nine times out of 10, you'll come back with a better solution than you might have if you had tried to work all the way through straight. Oh, okay. So I mean, really, there is an interaction between our mental state, uh, where we are in the problem, uh, and all of that. Obviously, that makes things very complicated. What we're mostly concerned with here is uh, is optimizing that divergent thinking. And we've already covered a bit about space and, and, and making things feel more open. What about uh, lighting? Are there any, uh, is there any information about lighting and the way that it interacts with our ability to be creative? Uh, quite a bit, actually. So uh, one study um, actually pegged the um, ideal lighting intensity level, how bright 
or dim light should be for ideation, for idea generation. What they found was that 150 lux is that kind of sweet spot. So 150 lux, just to give folks kind of a relative measure, uh, minimum for reading is 300 lux. Um, a general office lighting will be around 500. If you walk into a supermarket, it's probably around 1,000 lux. If you go outside on a rainy day, it's maybe 10,000. If you hmm. go out on a bright day, it's 100,000. So 150 lux is really darn dim, right? It, it's, it's almost nighttime here uh, inside. So there's a bunch of different ways we could possibly explain that. One goes back to our sense of space. So imagine you picture yourself at night, say, in, a, in your creative space, and you've only got you know one little lamp in the corner. It's on. It's just giving you that 150 lux. Well, if you sit in the middle of the space and you kind of sense of where you are, your, your sense of those enclosing planes, the walls, the boundaries are pretty much dissolved. The, the, they mm. tend to recede in the kind of murky darkness. So that sense of expansive space, especially if, again, if it's dark out, it just the walls are sort of dissolved. There's that. Um, there's something uh, definitely tied in with bright light and focused attention versus dim light and unfocused attention. So if you someone gave you a Swiss watch to repair and you take off the back, what's, what the first thing you're going to do is turn on that Luxo lamp and shine a really bright light on it because you need to focus your eyes, literally physically need that bright light to get the information into your brain so that you can start you know, playing around with it and fix it. Whereas uh, dim light means your eye has, you, know, you can't see anything practically and your eye has nothing to focus on so you can engage in what's called defocused attention, which is that mind-wandering, zigzag, circuitous mental processing we use when we're trying to give some, you know, flesh to our ideas when we're trying to give shape to our ideas. So there's that side. But of course, you know, that this is a good example of that really only kind of applies, works in very early stage creativity because you can't work at a certain point if you're totally in the darkness. But hmm. there's um, another dimension of lighting that is very useful called circadian lighting. So I'm sure a lot of people have heard circadian rhythm, circadian cycle. This is that 24-hour cycle that's regulated by the sun. Think of the sun rising in the morning. What color is it? It's that kind of warm amber. As the morning wears on, it starts turning bluer and bluer. That kind of blue intensity peaks roughly around midday. Then the sun starts setting over the horizon. It gets a little less blue, less blue. It gets almost neutrally until reverting back to uh, an amber condition. So what we've, you know, very conclusively found, of course, is that the human body is very, is meant to be, is certainly genetically engineered to be very attuned to that cycle, various hormones and um, body um, operations are tied to that rhythm because of the color of the light coming into our eyeballs and getting channeled into our brain. This is why the iOS now has night shift on it and it gets exactly. that amber color. And I mean, I even wear orange goggles at night, uh, you know, while I'm reading or whatever. Well, that's actually very important because what's happened, the reason you have to do that is because we spend 90% of our time indoors. And nowadays, maybe we spend 90% of our time looking at computer screens indoors, which is all blue light. Our bodily rhythms are just totally whacked out because our brains are expecting that blue light to give way to an amber light so we can start feeling sleepy when the melatonin starts kicking in to our um, our system as a result of the change of light outdoors. So what you want to do is mimic the outdoor light with your electric illumination, assuming you need some to do your daily work. And there are products on the market today that can start to bring us into that kind of circadian lighting cycle on uh, color changing LEDs, for example, app control. You can start to set them to go from that amber to blue to amber again and kind of restore some of that synchronicity between light, lighting, and creative test performance because you're going to be at your best the closer you can kind of regulate yourself to the circadian cycle. I mean, it's really funny. First of all, what you said about uh, earlier about the, the amount of lux outside versus inside, it's just amazing that um, that there's that big of a difference. And it really tells you uh, something about, I guess, our perception of light and the the fact that it, it might not seem that different when we're outside on a rainy day versus when we're inside, but it can actually be, you know, 10x different in terms of the amount of light that's actually being put out there. Uh, second, this whole idea that like the color of the light can have such a profound effect on us. It's one of these things that the first time you hear it, you're kind of like, what? Really? Is that... How is that even possible? Like the color of light, is it even, is it even any different, uh, you know, when I'm outside versus when I'm inside in the light bulbs? Uh, I mean, are, are there concrete things you can tell us that can help convince the skeptics? 
Oh, well, it's it's been, I think, conclusively demonstrate that our hormonal uh, secretions are very much tied to the cycle. I mean, you know, why do you think you go to sleep at night just because it's dark or mm -hmm. what somebody told you is the end of day? Um, I've been up all day, you know, I'm just tired. <laughs> well, yeah, but why not the I other way watch around? TV before I go to sleep, you know, what difference does it make? <laughs> well, that'll make? really fry your brains. Um, no, it's, it's, I, I think it's we're kind of beyond dispute as to the fact that your hormones, and they can measure this, will secrete serotonin in the morning, which is kind of the happy hormone, gets you going, gets you up for the day. And at night, uh, melatonin, which is your sleepy drug, and it's all pegged to light. I mean, it's it's not a question of dispute. It's more a question, what do we do about the fact that mm -hmm. everything is just thrown completely out of whack by modernity? And that's the big problem we're having. That's why you get that app for colorizing your screen and you get Arianna Huffington, you know, starting a whole venture all about sleeplessness because a lot of that stuff comes from the fact that our biorhythms are thrown off a whack. And yes, a lot of it starts with color, with light. And I remember reading about uh, how some studies that they used to do or maybe still do where they would like put people in an underground bunker exactly. where they can't actually see uh, sunlight and, and then they experiment with different timings of light and they start to find some interesting things as far as, you know, their sleep cycles uh, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe they take some, uh, hormonal readings or something. I don't actually remember all the details of those studies, but it's really fascinating when you, when you hear about it, because when you, when you first hear that this could be a thing, even, you know, it's kind of hard to believe. Yeah, well, believe it, because <laughs> as you say, uh, you know, that study you referenced, you I think I even, it, but, yeah. I even um, reference it in the book. That is absolutely true. They've even done studies where even deprivation of light during the day uh, studied workers in windowless environments. So they're not getting any natural light in the course of the day. They sleep 46 minutes on average less than people who get standard amounts of light even indoors. So there's lots of data on this um, connecting the two. It's funny because you could probably ask any one of them, oh, does this affect you? And they would probably think, nah, <laughs> just the same way that, uh, you know, you go outside and you think that uh, the light's not all that different from from where, where you're inside. It's just there's so many things that we think that we can't perceive, but they're actually happening. I mean, it reminds me of even, uh, I can't remember the name of the guy who, who first proposed that, you know, maybe we should... Um, wash our hands after we handle dead bodies, you know, before we deliver babies, because it might reduce infant mortality. And he ended up dying in an insane asylum <laughs> because everybody thought he was nuts, like, because people can't see bacteria, right? So they just thought he was nuts. And it goes to show you that sometimes things that you can't perceive are actually affecting you in ways that you're unaware of. And yes, and a lot of this material are things that are sort of counterintuitive. Um, they are operating subliminally in a lot of cases. And, um, you know, that, that was kind of the fun of finding a, lo a lot of these correlations because it runs counter to what maybe the sort of conventional wisdom suggests. Mm -hmm. You know, a good example of that, uh, just speaking of these, would be the, the uh, aspect of noise. So, you know, if you ask most people, well, what's your ideal kind of creative environment in terms of noise? I think the large majority would say, well, of course, quiet. Well, uh, according to the research, uh, not so much. Uh, mm -hmm. What they found is that a kind of background noise of about 70 decibels, right? That's about what you would hear in your local coffee shop or Starbucks on a moderately busy day is actually a sweet spot for creative idea generation. Mm -hmm. You go, what? Um, well, it kind of makes some sense because what you want to do is to give just enough kind of distraction from your kind of mental processing so as to kind of keep you from becoming self-conscious about being conscious, um, in a sense, taking you out of that convergent mindset and keeping you on the convergent side. But here again, uh, you know, this is talking about general population. So if you were more of an introvert, like Susan Cain, who wrote that wonderful book called Quiet, um, if you're that type, if you're Marcel Proust, where you can't filter out anything, you need like 100% quiet. But for the rest of us, a little mm. bit of background noise, and here's the key, it has to be white noise. So it can be chatter, it can be a waterfall, it can be wind rustling through the leaves. These are just perfect sounds where you're not, you know, drawn to them. You know how people hate in workplaces to hear the conversation, the telephone conversation, the person next to them. That's exactly the opposite of white noise. Mm -hmm. But if you can kind of make it inside of kind of back of mind, it actually will help you um, crank out those good ideas. 
Well, and, and the perception of noise is also one of these things where uh, you, you might think that you're in a silent room, but if you actually took a reading of it, it might be 50 decibels and you just haven't even, uh, you haven't even noticed it. And so it's funny, there can be these things where we uh, perceive things to be one way, but it's actually another way and it's, and it's affecting us in some way. Uh, now, what you said about the, the coffee shop, that makes, that makes perfect sense. And I think it, it goes into what I was talking about with my morning routine, which is that I, I'll, I put in earplugs as well. So I, I try to keep things silent. I mean, I can hear my own heart beating perhaps or something like that. But then it's the, in the afternoon for me. I think that's the time where I'm a little higher energy. Uh, so it's actually a little bit more difficult for me to be creative. And that's where that noise, I find it seems to really get things bouncing for me and, and, and get things going. So obviously, things work differently for different people uh, and, and they should uh, act accordingly. Now, what about things like... Uh, the decorative elements of of a space, uh, patterns, uh, you know, colors, sh- shapes. You talked a little bit about difference between roundness and, and, and sharpness. Are there some things we should be looking out for uh, that would influence our creativity in our creative space? Yeah, there are quite a few things. Um, you know, so artwork, for example, uh, as you would sort of expect, would be a positive element in a creative space, you know, for all sorts of reasons. Um, in, in a lot of ways, creativity begets creativity. So when you surround yourself with elements of creativity, whether they're your own, which happen to be a very good thing to have up because it reinforces a sense of creative confidence, or mm-hmm. those of artists that you admire, all of that can kind of get the brain working. Um, even kind of hints like bookshelves, um, this not just hints, but obviously that you partake of external knowledge. That's an important feature. Fireplaces. There's another one that research has found. And here's a particularly interesting aspect of fireplaces. Um, not only does sitting by a, you know, real cackling wood fire um, kind of help the ideas flow. And there's some famous examples of inventors coming up with, you know, great ideas while sitting by the fireplace. But they've also found that just looking at a video on a monitor Hmm. or a TV of a fire can also bump up your divergent thinking capabilities. And this is an important point with a lot of these tactics that I talk about. It's not only the literal presence of the technique or tactic as well. That is, your space doesn't have to be itself necessarily physically large, but it, it can operate on a kind of metaphorical level. So artwork, for example, if you put up travel posters uh, to, you know, faraway places. So if you're in the U.S. or North America or South America and you get travel posters to Scotland or China or uh, India, that uh, sense of distance can be triggered into your consciousness the same way as if you were looking at a long vista. And so that will move you into that divergent, abstract, broad, big picture mindset without your literally ever, you know, stepping foot out of your door or seeing a long vista. So a lot of these cues can operate again, sort of subliminally, uh, metaphorically, however you want to describe it. Ah, so that's like the construal level is getting higher than when you were looking at travel pictures of faraway places. It's, it's, it's just like you're, you know, at the top of the skyscraper. Or exactly. Like they'll, that. They'll, they'll both operate in the same way. And, and if you want to double, kind of double bonus, make those travel posters vintage from the 1920s or 30s, wonderful pieces oh. of graphic art, because uh, according to control level theory, at least the sense of distance time, distant time, again, creates that, puts you into that abstract mindset, just as it does with physical distance. Oh, wow. And it's funny, it's reassuring to know that even if I don't have a fireplace in my place, or I can't afford a place with a fireplace, I don't have a giant mansion with a a fireplace like, um, like I'm, I don't know, Sherlock Holmes (laughs) or something, uh, then uh, I can just go on YouTube and uh, look up uh, a video of a fire and just keep that thing playing. And it it might, it might help me, uh, you know, solve my next mystery. (laughs) Now, what about uh, body position, Uh, our spaces, our furniture, etc. Shape, the way that we are moving our body, we were talking about the wall earlier, um, you know, standing, sitting, lying down. Are there different ways to influence our own body position and then in turn influence our ability to think creatively? Yes. Um, two, well, I'd say three postures uh, come to mind. First of all, we mentioned standing standing desks and, and become very popular. And I think that in this case, some of the research is still kind of happening, but there seems to be very positive um, impact 
when you stand rather than sit. You know, sitting is probably the least conducive position to be in in a divergent mindset, but standing mm. uh, seems to help us not only in terms of creativity, but also productivity as well. The other position that's good or a second position that's good is reclining. Um, so if you can, you know, get, get a lounger, uh, or just an upholstered chair or something, or maybe with an ottoman where you can put your foot up and kind of lean back. That also uh, is showing some very positive um, test performance improvements. And there are a lot of great you know, artists and creatives who have worked in that position. Truman Capote swore by it. He said, I'm totally a horizontal author. Um, so there's a lot of historical examples of that happening. And then, of course, moving, walking, exercising, those kind of locomotive positions also are... Um, very good for ideation. Uh, get the treadmill desk out. There is that. that that's gotten kind of mixed reviews. I personally can't <laughs> imagine doing it like trying to run and type at the same time. It just does not work yeah, for me. Yeah. Well, even, even you know, going for a walk and uh, yeah, speaking aloud into a voice recorder or, or jotting things down in a notebook uh, as you're walking, you know, it's something I think that is good to pay attention to is how these different ways that your body can be positioned uh, relative to your space, relative to where you are and what you're working on, relative to your own energy levels and fluctuations in your creativity. You know, you can really come up with a really mixed bag of things that you can grab and and use wherever you are in, in your creative projects. Absolutely. And I think the key is to kind of avoid the sedentary position as much as possible because body motion, uh, physical motion, and mind production all seem to go together. Yeah. So Donald M. Ratner, this this book, My Creative Space, How to Design Your Home to Stimulate Ideas and Spark Innovation. I genuinely love this book. It's so packed with uh, interesting science, uh, interesting tactics for enhancing your creativity. And also, I'm not really, I'm not a Pinterest guy, but maybe I should be because there's a lot of really inspiring photos in here of incredible spaces um, that really give you some good ideas, whether you have the power to remodel your place or you're just, you, maybe you can put some paint up or, or, or change your decorations. It's really an amazing book. I highly recommend it. People should go out and buy it. It's available right now on Amazon and, uh, and I guess everywhere books are sold. Anywhere else you'd like for people to uh, get more of you? Sure, you can visit my website. It's all one word, Donald Ratner. That's spelled R-A-T-T-N-E-R, so two T's, donaldratner.com. And I've got a resources page with lots of good books, including our host's books on it uh, that will carry oh, yeah. you further into Thank the you. study of creativity and productivity, uh, podcasts, events, seminars, all sorts of goodies. Um, I have some courses online as well and a blog. So yeah, check it out. And is there anything, any final message you'd like to give people uh, who are still processing this idea that their space could have some influence on the work that they do? Yeah, absolutely. First thing is that, look, there's 48 tactics in this book, but even implementing one of them can change your creativity level significantly. This has been the case for lots of people time and time again. And the other thing is you don't have to spend necessarily a lot of money uh, to implement a lot of these tactics. As I mentioned just a little while ago, simply changing the orientation of your desk, which is no cost, could make a big difference. So check it out. Um, you know, you could take it as far as you'd like to or as limited as you'd like to. Donald, thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure. Is Love Your Work helping you find your unique creative voice? Does it bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to become the creator and human you want to be? If so, please be a part of making this a special and nourishing and thoughtful show. Support the show on Patreon. You'll be an even bigger part of this show than you already are. If you contribute just a coffee a month, you'll be helping support the hosting and production of Love Your Work. Everyone has some unique creative gift to offer the world. Together, we can give people the tools they need to bring that work into the world. The world will be better off for it. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash This is a different kind of model for supporting the work that you love. The choice is yours. Vote with your dollars. Put your money where your mind is and keep love your work going. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash As a thank you, you'll get early access, bonus content, and a discount on Love Your Work merchandise. Learn more at patreon.com slash cadavy. That's patreon.com slash K-A-D as in David, A-V as in Victor, Y. 
And if you can't support the show financially, and you've listened to at least three episodes, can you do me a favor? Write a review on Apple Podcasts. You can consider it your donation to help support the show. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our Patreon supporters, such as mini sponsor Paula Spriggs, and top supporters such as Jeffrey Mason and Vitas Pankovicius. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for this show is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs>